Here's a great question that a lot of people might be curious about. What makes a Miyazaki film sound pretty? And the obvious answer that everyone in the comments section is going to give us is that Mamoru Fujisawa, aka Joe Hisaishi, is just a brilliant composer. And you don't need to look into it any farther than that. And what interests me whenever I have an exchange like this is that very few people take into account their own biases. Like, okay, Hisaishi's music sounds pretty. Or does Hisaishi's music sound pretty to you? What is it about his music that you think sounds pretty? Why do you specifically specifically think it sounds pretty. See, for a lot of people, Hisaishi's work is going to sound similar to another composer by the name of Claude Debussy. Debussy was one of the impressionist composers, meaning that he was one of the first composers who broke away from the traditions of the Romantic period. Wagner? Screw that guy. Beethoven? Overrated. Brahms? Don't make me laugh. Let's write a bunch of whole tone scales that never resolve. The idea behind Impressionism in music was that instead of exploring the harmonic motion and fundamental resolutions of the older Romantic style, the Impressionists would focus more on color and timbre. Instead of these carefully calculated phrases, they might not really establish the key signature at all, and would use techniques like extended harmonies, parallel motion, and modes along with other unfamiliar scales to explore new sounds. Uh, I'm gonna do my best to just breeze past these music theory terms because I don't want this video to get any longer than it has to be. The reason we associate Debussy and the Impressionist composers with Impressionism is because Impressionism was all about suspending a moment in time on the canvas. They're the original, you kinda gotta squint at them to get what's going on, kind of paintings. And personally, there's some of my favorite. I really like this one. But when it comes to music, since Debussy and company wouldn't really follow the rules of the last few hundred years, they'd explore the areas outside of tonality, which meant that their music wouldn't use the standard method of tension and release or resolution to drive their melodies and harmonies. In other words, they didn't follow the rules that had existed for the last few hundred years, which at times made it feel like their music wasn't going anywhere, or on occasion, it would feel like it was almost suspended in time. But that lack of intense regulated harmonic motion that you'd see in something like Beethoven kind of makes Debussy's pieces feel a little more relaxed overall. Instead of moving in a clear direction, sometimes they kind of just gently float in whatever space they're in. And for a lot of people, that sounds peaceful, or ethereal, or shimmery, or even pretty. And if you crack open Hisaishi's works, you see a lot of similar techniques being used. He uses pentatonic scales and modes. He uses extended harmonies. Some chordal and quintal harmonies. And even some planing or parallel motion. Again, I'm not going to explain a lot of these terms, I'm just trying to prove a parallel between these composers. So it looks like Hisaishi was a huge fan of Debussy and used a lot of Debussy's works as inspiration, right? Except that these two don't really line up super well at times. Like, yeah, Hisaishi will use pentatonic melodies, but every once in a while he'll just start including notes outside of the pentatonic scale for seemingly no reason. Or the pentatonic scale that he uses won't really fit into what a pentatonic scale actually is. And yeah, Hisaishi will use chordal and quintal harmonies, but he'll also throw in some of those upper extensions at the same time for seemingly no reason, which I don't think was Debussy's speed. What I'm saying is, is that some of these techniques don't line up super cleanly, and I couldn't quite figure out why. And on top of all of that, you can also draw some parallels between Hisaishi's work and modal jazz from the 1960s. Jazz, coming from blues, will always have the same pentatonic element to it. This tune in particular uses chordal and quintal harmonies along with some stagnated harmonic motion, which you can also see in some of Hisaishi's work. And since modal jazz emerged after bebop, you can bet you're gonna see a lot of harmonic extensions. And I mean, it's called modal jazz and I can find a few places where Hisaishi used a mode or two. So maybe Hisaishi liked both Debussy and modal jazz. Sure, but that still doesn't explain how and why he breaks the rules. Where did he get that idea from? Well, check it out. Back in the Tang Dynasty, the Chinese notion of music theory, music notation, and music literacy had begun to spread to Japan. During this time, the Japanese began to use these Chinese scales to write their gagaku and shomyo. Now, gagaku was the music written and performed for the imperial courts. Sure.
Shomyo, on the other hand, was a form of Buddhist chant and was unique to Japan. Well, the problem during this time was that not a lot of Japanese individuals were super enthusiastic on maintaining any form of consistency. For whatever reason, the theory and notation began to diverge as it spread throughout Japan. Different places and musicians would have different meanings for the same term, which made communication among musicians difficult and later made it almost impossible for musicologists to create a useful analytical model. It wasn't until the beginning of the 20th century when a scholar by the name of Fumio Koizumi managed to figure out how the Japanese used their music. In short, and I know this video is kind of dense on the music theory, Theory, I promise I'm trying to keep it simple. Basically, the Japanese weren't using full scales that spanned an octave the way that we would use them in the West. Instead, they were using half scales, or as Koizumi calls them, tetrachords. There were four tetrachords. They'd all have the same starting and end notes, relatively speaking, but the note in the middle would be different for each of the four tetrachords. And depending on which of the four notes you used in between the top and bottom notes, you'd get a different tetrachord. So if you wanted a full scale that extended for a full octave the way that we in the West would expect, then you just put two tetrachords together and bam, you've got something that looks like a pentatonic scale, except that it isn't. You can make the Western pentatonic scale with this system, but this flexible system allows for some pretty crazy configurations that sound uniquely Japanese and in no way, shape or form would ever be called pentatonic by Western standards. But then World War II happened. Kind of a sudden topic change, I know, but with the fallout of World War II, Japan ended up adopting a lot of American culture. Baseball, cheerleaders, marching band, and at some point, KFC on Christmas. Seriously, what's up with that? But while that was all happening, Japan wanted to preserve their musical culture, and so we saw the rise of hybrid Japanese Western music. Something like Enka, which was a style of pop music that was designed to become kind of like a new style of folk music that maintained something traditionally Japanese in how it sounded. Something that would feel Japanese, but would work in a new Japan that was quickly becoming westernized. <laughs> And in order to compensate for that, Japan had to come up with two new scales that would work within the confines of Western harmony, but still sound traditionally Japanese. And they ended up with the Yonanuki Cho Onkai and the Yonanuki Tan Onkai, or the major pentatonic and minor pentatonic scales of Japan. The Yonanuki Cho Onkai, or the Japanese major pentatonic scale, looks like this, which is interesting because our Western major pentatonic scale looks like this. They are the exact same. And the Yonanuki Tan Onkai, or the Japanese minor pentatonic scale, looks like this, which all joking aside is actually really interesting. Okay, so this is the Japanese minor pentatonic scale, but this is the Western minor pentatonic scale. Okay, so just for some context, this is the major and minor standard scales in the West. See, it's just these three notes that are the difference between the two of them. So it looks like they took their major pentatonic scale and did the exact same thing to it that we do to our standard major scale in order to make it our minor minor scale, and that's how they got their minor pentatonic scale, which is different from the Western minor pentatonic scale because of modes and consistent intervals, blah, blah, theory, blah, blah. So long story short, the musical history of Japan is complicated and confusing, but it ends up emphasizing these pentatonic figures that may or may not cleanly coincide with Western harmonic traditions. So what that means is that when Hisaishi writes something that sounds kind of pentatonic, but also sort of breaks the rules, we know why. Whether he knows it or not, there's some kind of traditional Japanese influence on the way he writes his music. And you can see that in all of the ways that he breaks from traditional impressionist techniques and even modal jazz. That's because whatever he's writing fits into a traditionally Japanese sound, which is also why he uses pentatonic figures and shapes in his melodies that might not completely conform to our sense of what a pentatonic scale is. And chordal and quintal harmonies fit really well into supporting a pentatonic sound because of Pythagoras and triangles and cutting a string into half and thirds and math. Seriously though, these shapes are just the whole pentatonic scale stacked on top of itself, but when he breaks the standard shapes or adds harmonic extensions, he's still maintaining pretty much every note of some pentatonic scale, even though it might not be Western. In the only transcription of a gagaku that I managed to find, if you look at the part written for the biwa, which is this instrument right here, if you look at what the biwa is playing, sure enough, you see the same chordal and quintal harmonies. And this is really important as to why Hisaishi's music sounds the way that it does. You know, uh, shave and a haircut? If I stop it here, 
it sounds frustrating. You need to have that ending for it to sound like it resolves. And again, it's a complicated musical topic, but this piece of music feels like it needs to end or resolve because of these notes in your regular major scale. But these two notes are missing in a pentatonic scale. So when you hear a pentatonic scale playing, it won't have as much pull in one direction or another as your standard major scale, which is something that Debussy liked when he was using similar scales, like this whole tone scale. It pretty much never resolves, and it gives his music that floaty, ethereal feeling. But with these Japanese pentatonic scales and tetrachords, sometimes they feel like they don't resolve, sometimes it feels like they do. And it's that shift back and forth that can really disrupt a Westerner's ears, and in some cases makes Hisaishi sound like Debussy or even modal jazz. Like, take a look at this piece of traditional Japanese folk music written in the Edo period called Sakura Sakura. It can sound kind of haunting, but at the same time, it may still have that pull to cadence or resolve at the end of a phrase. But I'll do you one better. Check out an even older piece of Japanese folk music written back in the Heian, Heian? Heian period. <laughs> What you just listened to is Kimi Gayo, the national anthem of Japan, and this is how it ends. Now, to Western ears, that probably sounds unfinished, but that's the end of the piece. It sounds unfinished because you're listening to a Japanese piece of music with Western ears. You're not familiar with how this music system works, so you subconsciously apply the musical language that you're familiar with. The same musical language that makes the end of Shave and a Haircut feel like it has to resolve. And the same thing is going to happen when you sit down and watch a Studio Ghibli film directed by Hayao Miyazaki. In November 2009, Joe Hisaishi was awarded the Medal of Honor with Purple Ribbon, the highest honor a Japanese citizen can achieve. The purple ribbon recognizes the individual's academic and artistic developments, improvements, and accomplishments. This is a country that didn't have any significant cultural ties to people like Wagner until after their country was devastated by war. Without Wagner, there was no one like Korngold, and without someone like Korngold, there would be no one like John Williams. So when Hisaishi had to write a score for a film that was going to have the same kind of influence that Disney had, but for a Japanese audience, he probably stuck to whatever he knew people would respond to to. Something that would sound comfortable. Something that would sound familiar. So if you listen to a Miyazaki film and you think it sounds pretty, or maybe even ethereal, there's a chance that being exposed to Western music could have created some kind of bias in your interpretation of music. But if you ever got to sit down with someone who was born and raised in Japan and had the opportunity to ask them what they thought of the music in a Miyazaki film, I wonder what they'd say. Thank you for watching. I'd like to thank my patrons for making these videos possible with a very special thank you to AFN Matt and Anna Birch. Uh, if you like what you saw here, be sure to subscribe and check out my other videos. Follow me on Twitter and Twitch to have your musical questions answered live. And if you really like what I'm doing, consider supporting my channel on Patreon. But that's going to be it from me for now. Thanks for watching.